We are the waiting ones, longing for the day to come when we are no longer waiting on the one who can save us from ourselves, waiting with bated breath for hope to reach out its hand from heaven and heal our helpless hearts, waiting for a light to spark, a light to dawn, a light to diffuse the dark we drawn like curtains over our souls, waiting for the promise to unfold like a map leading us to the treasure of treasures so we can behold and believe, waiting for peace to supersede our anxieties and flow like a river through a dry and weary land where there is no water, waiting for the Father to see fit to find us in our pit, pining in our sin, the spiritual slum we lived in. But when the fullness of time had come, he sent forth his only Son, incarnate one, the manifestation of God in the flesh, the epitome of a promise kept. He left heaven's majesty so we no longer have to be waiting. The birth of a baby a king, come to redeem the world he created. God, born in a borrowed stable, the light of man in a makeshift cradle. This is not a fable. The one who we have waited for is here. Peer into the manger and behold him who welcomes the stranger and breaks the chains of every captive. Our maker, our savior, our master is here, casting our fear into the ocean of his love. Emmanuel, God with us, go shout it on the mountain, cause our waiting is done. What if we were known more for what we love instead of what we hate? Would that make a difference? What if we spent more time loving people and less time being angry with them? Would that make a difference? What if we gave unconditionally of our time, our talent, and our treasures? Would that make a difference? What if we shared the difference Jesus has made in our lives and stopped pushing away those who aren't there yet? Would that make a difference? What if we walked in the steps of our Savior, sitting with the broken, caring for the poor, loving the lost? Would that make a difference? We live in the midst of ruins, surrounded by brokenness pain, and loss. It's a moment made for us, a calling we were created to answer, not with judgment, not with harsh words or self-righteousness, but with love, the love of Jesus. What if the church acted like the church that make a difference?
before I want to worship deeper than before No more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yes. Come on, if you believe that, just sing that with us today. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yes. Yes, we're free indeed. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am No more chains, no more bondage I am free, yes Come on, let's sing that all together, say No more shackles, no more chains No more bondage, I am free
And death is not the end, Jesus, you are, you are safe here, fear is not
lift it up He loves to hear your voice Oh, 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 oh. The victory belongs to Jesus Oh, oh Victory belongs to Him. Oh, 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 victory belongs to Jesus. Victory belongs to Him. Victory belongs to you. Yes, it does. Hey there! Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Good evening, World Changers. Welcome to Saturday Night Service. Pastor Wes here, here to bring you another life-changing word. Thanks for tuning in. It's awesome to connect with you guys. If it's your first time checking us out, thanks for giving us a try. I hope tonight's message blesses you, brings you hope, and I hope you'll return. We have virtual services every Thursday at 7 p.m., every Saturday, like right now at 6 p.m., and then we have our in-person service every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. at the Alhambra Ballroom if you live in the local area. I hope to see you there. To our beloved New York family, thank you guys for tuning in. Wherever you may be, not just New York, but around the world, I know we have people jump in, even all the way on the West Coast in California. Thank you guys for tuning in. It's awesome to connect with you. So let's get right into this with communion, and then we're going to get into the Word. Communion, as we take this bread, chips, cracker, cookie, whatever you got, it reminds us and puts us back in focus of God is good. And that goodness is unconditional. And that when Jesus' body was broken, it reminds us our relationship with God cannot be broken is what I emphasize. That when we think we can undo the gift of right standing with God and our relationship with God, God reminds us we cannot, that God will not separate from us, God will not distance himself from us. God is forever unconditionally loving us. So as you take this, know you are the righteous of God and you can eat. As we take the juice, it reminds us of the blood of Jesus that was poured out on the cross. And I think to the statement that Jesus made, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Not because they asked for forgiveness. Not because they even were aware of that forgiveness. Jesus made the declaration of, I am not holding sin against you. I am not having issue with you. I am not making you do anything to deserve that or earn that or receive that or anything. I am just extending it to you because this is who I am. So in this moment, what it reminds us, man, we're good with God, that we should not be ashamed to come before God, condemned to come before God, judged, beat up, or any of those things, that we can approach to God with boldness and receive love, mercy, and help in our time of need. So as you take this, know you are loved by God and you can drink. All right, let's pray and get started. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight for another word as you radically change our perspective of you. May we see you more clearly as love and unconditional love and receive that and let it change our lives. Father, I admit I need you to order my steps, articulate my words. May it be a revelation from you, about you, that points people ultimately back to you. And I thank you for an on-time word that ministers to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. 
All right, let's get right back into this. Uh, we've been talking about, I believe this is week three, um, this is what we got. Sometimes I'm like, we did Sunday, we did Thursday, and some of it is a little overlap, but it's all good as we come before this right here, uh, this series I've been in, which is a big God filtered through a small self. And we've been talking about how big God is. And we started off with just right up front, God is love. And as we see that love unconditionally, without having to try to obtain it through one sole avenue or one exclusive way, we start realizing, man, God is available to all in all humanity in that love. And what we're trying to do is get out of our old ideas, and that's what we spent the last two weeks talking about, is our willingness to, to, to grow out of our old understanding of God and come into the new understanding of God, which really truly is God, is love, and step away from transactional religion where I have to do to get God to be good. See, I don't think the church at this stage is really arguing much whether God is love or not anymore. Because I got realized and I would say, God is love, God is love, God is love. And people are like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I realized people are really, and even myself, I was like, I don't think we're really receiving God as love. What, what is it that makes God love? Is that there's no conditions on that love. And when for God to truly be the big loving God he is, we have to remove those conditions. Because I realize all of us, we were saying, well, God is love if. God is love when, and it would typically lead to when we do something or don't do something. And that's performance-driven love, and that is not true, authentic, giving love. And that's what we're pushing for is those ideas. Now, what shrinks God is our selfishness. We talked a little bit about that last week, and we'll get into a little more of the filters that selfishness brings and, and, and brings God down to being small and shrinks God. So let's, let's get into some scriptures here first. Let's go to, actually, let's start with, and then we'll go to my, our foundational scripture in 2 Corinthians. Let's start with 2 Timothy 2.15. The 2 Timothy 2.15 from the New King James Version. I'm going to read it. It says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, Paul was writing this to a pastor, which was Timothy. So it's really more instruction for a pastor, but it can apply to all of us. We want to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. We want to be able to rightly divide God. And this is kind of one of those resets to do just that, um, to filter God correctly, to see God correctly, and to recognize when we're filtering God and dividing God from selfishness versus the spiritual side of us, the God side of us, which we talked about last week in Galatians 5 which we'll probably get over there again. So everything I'm presenting to you, it's like, what am I doing? Why am I presenting? So we can rightly divide God and really divide God as love and read the word and read our ideas about, and not read, but see our ideas about God, have ideas about God that line up with love. So there is, I'll say this first of all, there is a purpose for filtering God or breaking down God. Filtering may not be the best word in this context, I've realized. It's more, you know how we break down God? I'm breaking down God and giving you a fragment of who God's in this, God is in this message. Uh, why is that? Because like we read last week over in John 20, I believe it was 21, it says, John even wrote all the acts and all the things about Jesus could not be filled in all the books in the world. So they weren't contained all in the Bible. There was so much more Jesus did that we don't have on record. And so what does that mean? God is bigger than what we can even read there. So I say this in, I can only cover so much in about 35, 40 minutes here. And we talked about last week, not getting centered around one teaching or one idea, because we tend to say, well, we got this revelation and that's all there is. And we're done. Close chapter, close book. There's nothing more, nothing get bigger. But that's not even how the Bible works. They used to think Moses was, they used to think Abraham was the end of the line. Nope. Then Moses came along. Then Moses took it to a new level. You used to think Moses was the end of the line. Nope. Then really, honestly, Jesus came along is what is. And you used to think that was the end of the line, Jesus and the 12. And then, nope, Paul came along and Paul took it to another level. So you see each time you think you've ended it, it keeps growing. Well, how do we look at that? We used to think uh, healing was the end of the line. Man, God is a healer, not the one that makes six. Then we realize, well, God's not the one that wants us broke. Um, God wants us to have our needs met. 
And then we came in that understanding. And then we started realizing other things. Women can be preachers. Do you see how progression works with our understanding? I'm not trying to change God. I'm trying to change us and our understanding of God and how we see God. But we have to recognize how we filter God and how we see God and, and be able to pick up on that and, and, and sort through some things. So there is a purpose for breaking down and teaching God is really comprehending. I say this, uh, I've said this in this teaching multiple times on Sundays and Thursdays, which is how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And that's how we have to break down God, not because God is broken down in all these messages and pieces. It's so we can try to start wrapping our head around how big God truly is. And I'll, I'll insert this real quick before I get into these. Why am I inserting all these filters? Because I'm going to talk, a, well, let me say it this way. Let me, let me back up before I say that. Let me read this scripture like we were going to in 2 Corinthians, and then let me go over to the filter side. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 10 through 14, this is our foundation scripture. It says, in fact, that first glory was not glorious at all co compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way, which has been replaced, was glorious, how much glorious is the new way which reign, remains forever. What is the new way versus the old way? The way we approach God. It was really, the challenging was the, the idea around righteousness, about am I, on good, am I in good with God or am I out? And did I keep all the rules to be in good with God or did I, I mess up and am I out? Am I, and they, they would grapple with the ideas and we still grapple with these ideas today, even though really we, we got to come to a place where we kind of shouldn't at this point. We got to come out of that petty fighting about this. Really, it all centers around righteousness. But that's what Paul is challenging the church in Corinth that he started with. Verse 12 says, Since this new way about righteousness gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. Very bold in what? How we approach and access God. 13. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. But when the people's minds were hardened, and to this day, whenever uh, the old covenant is being read, the same veil covers their mind so they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can only be removed by believing in Christ. Now, the example of that, this is kind of like what I talk about a filter uh, and, and how we see God and, and understand God. You know, I, I give this example I have in this series on Thursdays and Sundays, which is, you know, um, when I got married, I remember Nicole came down the aisle, all this stuff. We were at the paradise and, you know, Dr. Dollar and Pastor Taffy was there and, and our friends and loved ones and family were there. And when she came down the aisle, she had the bride's veil over her. So you couldn't fully make out her face. And as she got closer to me, she, her face came a little more clear, but she still had that veil over it. And then she got in front of me and we're standing there looking each other face to face, but there's still that veil. And the truth is, you know, even though Nicole and I had been together, you know, dated for a year, engaged for about a year, two years, you know, so I knew what she looked like already. But uh, in that moment, I could not make out all her features behind the veil. I could see certain distinctions about it, but I couldn't see every little detail like I could before when there was no veil. And how, when, what happened? You know, that, that awesome, amazing moment, you can kiss your bride now. You know, after, you know, Dr. Dollar, you know, the pastor told us that, and I lift and remove the veil. Well, I could see her clearly in all her, 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 her face. And that's what we're talking about. You can see in all her glory, you know, that, that's what we're talking about right there. So in the same way, that's, one of, that's how a lot of times our understanding of God, we're having to lift that veil off. And if we don't move from our old understanding it's not that we don't see God. It's that just like I gave you that example, I'm seeing her through that veil and I can't make out and distinguish every little thing about it. That's the same way about God. And that is what Paul is trying to say. I get all the Old Testament. I get the prophets. I get everything about it. But understand, they were writing from the perspective of the veil over their eyes. They could not fully see God in God's entirety. And I'm telling you, I have been lifting the veil I have been taking off these filters and I've been taking off these blind spots and my understanding has been opening and I am seeing God in a whole new way. 
And that God is bigger and God is better than we ever thought. And God is more love than we ever thought. And we don't have to do all these sacrifices. We don't have to clip the front of our, you know, guys, our, 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 our parts right there to, to please God and, and be all these different things. We don't have to do all these exercises. And here's the thing. New church, we, we're, we look at that Old Testament stuff. We're like, yeah, we never do that. We'd never be sacrificed and do all that, but we invented a new form of sacrifice. This is all we did. We invented a new way of chants and incantations and all these different things. We just switched it and we updated it as all we did. We, look, we, we sit there and you'll hear preachers mock. I can't believe, you know, these people, people on these islands, these savages. And I know there's a lot of tone, uh, undertones with that. And I, I'm pointing that out. When I say that, you know, they, they, they're making these stupid little chants and prayers and, and this, and they're, they're, they're sacrificing to their God and this, it, as if we don't do that right now in the modern day church. Just because we ain't bringing a, a, a goat or a bull down the middle of the aisle and sacrificing them right there doesn't mean we don't do some symbolic variation of the same thing and intellectually process it that way. You know, we did that, I mean, welcome to tithing and tithe and offering. We built a whole sacrificial system over that. We built all these systems. Oh, they're doing their prayers and chants. Dude, we got all our own prayers and chants around here that we think all of a sudden that just moves God and gets us access to God. Nothing wrong with all these things that I'm like, you're just knocking down everything. I'm knocking down the why. Please hear me. I am not trying to burn it all down, knock it all down. I am trying to gut out the why, though, because the why has a lot of selfishness in it. The why blinds us and acts as a veil to seeing who God really is. And when we see God really for who He is, we start realizing our why, we do what we do, is completely backwards. And that is really what Paul is trying to do, say here. He's not trying to say, man, we still need God. We still need access to God. We still uh, need this connection point. But why we do it, how we do it, how we go about it? All right, let me get back to this. So we read the scripture. We just talked about the veil being removed now. So let's talk about some things that we are to progress out of some of these filters. Let me go through some of these filters and walk us through them. So... I have five filters I want to talk about tonight that we tend to do th- that we tend to hear God and God is expressed through. Now, am I going to say we can change every one of these filters or that every one of these filters are like evil, bad? That's not the point, actually. The point is to recognize it though, and recognize how to sort through this. And if you can recognize how to sort through this, it gets a lot easier to comprehend God, and these things don't become stumbling blocks to you. The first one, it's going to be a little tough, but let, let's go on this, this thing. And, and, and let, me, let me answer this before I read again, because I'm trying to walk gently into this so I don't freak people out. As I have walked through my own journey, and I have pastored people through things enough, I have done enough advisements, I have done enough different variations of things and conversations with people, it, it, it has shown that people don't know how to distinguish that God is filtered through flawed systems. And, there, and, and, and there's nothing saying we need to just get rid of the flaw systems. It's the fact that the problem is we don't want to acknowledge they are flawed. And they're the best we have right now. And we're always working on them. We're always trying to do better with them. But they are there. And so what we tend to do, because we don't acknowledge them as flawed, we say, oh, well, this is the exact perfect will of God being expressed. And then we end up injured. We end up hurt. We end up angry. I know I have. And I'm like, well, I thought you said this is who God was and this and that. Um, Things can be a little off. Things can be wrong. And then what happens, it tends to turn into this violent, um, but almost like you betrayed me and now I don't believe anything you say. And sometimes we have to recognize the balance. It's like, how do we sort through that? How do I sort through my favorite preacher when stuff in their life doesn't seem to be working for me? They're human. Um, so let me walk through this. The first one is church institutions. And 
I, I'm very clear in my stance about church, and, and to everybody, to each their own, I say, I'm not here to debate with, with people or tell people how they should view church institution. That's not my place. I'm more sharing my perspective and my stance on this one that I have seen over the years. I still believe in church institution because clearly here we are today. We wouldn't be here. You know, I, I oversee one. I pastor one. Um, and that's where, you know, what came out of me a lot on Thursday night, what I call what the church could be, because that's what Thursday night is called. I don't really call it a Bible study. It's intentionally called what the church could be. And what I mean by that is I believe in the power of church, but I also believe the institutional in a lot of ways is, is heavily flawed and fractured. And if we don't do something about it, there may not be a church in a couple decades. And it ain't going to be because people are like sinning and people just turn away from God. It's because the church is going to self-destruct. The church right now is, is on a self-destructive curve because it is completely lost love. And so what I've, I've really emphasized for our church is, and, it, and let me tell you, I, I am so just pleased as a pastor to experience what our church is doing. And I can definitely see it on Sundays. Why do you say Sundays? Because I'm able to physically interact and be in the room with you. And it is why we emphasize this year is the year of empathy and action, where it's no longer to talk the talk and, and say we love and love people, but it is to really aggressively step outside of selfishness and step into the fact we are going to love people in a way that this world has never seen before and to challenge ourselves to not be so selfish about it. Um, and, and really approach things. And, and this message has this infused into it, by the way. And so, you know, that's why I said what's missing from the church really at the end of the day is that right there. The church can be cold. The church can be harsh, hard, and judgmental. And here's why. It's because that's how we see God. And that is the small God right there. That is a small God filtered through a, a selfish. And so what you're seeing is, when I'm mentioning this, it's not that necessarily church institution is bad because I do believe in a place where people can come together and connect with each other and build community and collectively get to know God and experience God together. And that is something very beautiful and powerful. And I don't think we can just throw that away and replace that. I think spirituality is a super important part of that to be experienced. What I think is the institution got out of place where the institution is meant to serve the people so people can do that. But what turned around, the institution got hijacked with selfishness and corruption. And not all of it, as there is good churches out there. I mean, I believe we're a good church, but I also believe that we are not a perfect church that is just completely magically immune from what I'm talking about either. And neither am I as a pastor. I can fall into these things. I can lead in this direction. I have to resist it weekly on a weekly basis because it is the overall general flow. And but so the church got hijacked with a lot of selfishness, and now it says people serve me instead of the the institution serving the people. And as soon as preachers hear that, they're like, "Oh well, these people are too stupid to know what they really want. These people don't really know because I know better." You hear a lot of ego in it, by the way. Because our fear of we're going to lose control. Well, the people don't always know what they need to know and this and that. And, da -da. and, and there's a balance with all this is what I'm saying. But it, it really is a lot of demands we pose and what the church institutions say, well, do this because this is what God wants, is not do this because God wants. It's do this because the church needs it to survive. And, and what I'm talking about, the actual thing, you know, we got to pay the rent next week. we got to pay the bills. we got to keep the lights on to get this. And I'm not saying even that is wrong. I'm saying when you say this is God, thus saith the Lord, and you mix those two together, we get problems in it. And it starts contaminating how God is represented and how God is filtered and how God is presented to us. For example, I used to think if I didn't tithe or give to the church, I would not be financially blessed. That is anti-grace because grace always says God does first and we respond to that. You got scripture for that? Go over to Abraham. We love quoting Father Abraham and Melchizedek. When did Abraham give to Melchizedek? When we quote that theology of tithing, 
Was it before or after Abraham was blessed? And you will see it as afterwards. Abraham already won the, won the war, all those different things, got all the spoils, things that, and out of the overflow of how God had blessed him, he blessed. That is a different conversation right there. And so it's reordering and restructuring things. But if, but if you know, a lot of times what happens, you know, pastor will get afraid, get pressure on him, get fear on him because he's trying to do or she's trying to do what God wants them to do. But they go about it in the wrong method and say, you need to give, or sometimes because it's passed on and passed on and passed on, this is all we know, is you better give or else. And there's a lot of fear tied to that. And once again, what did I start this whole thing, especially last week, I said, what makes God big? Love, but not just love, unconditional love with no strings attached, non-transactional religion. But when you bring it back to that, church institution gets into a transactional thing. Not because God's transactional, we think He is, but because the church has things because it's got to operate. And I think if people can't sort through that, and, and I had to learn how to do this, even in my own, you know, even being on the pastoral side, I had to start learning, okay, when is this a need of the church? And when is this really the Spirit of God, you know, saying this is what we need to live our lives by? And making sure those stay in their proper place. It's not that either one is necessarily like, well, the church has needs. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing evil about that. I tell you guys at the end of every, every one of these messages, hey, um, I give you an opportunity to give. Why though? But I'm very transparent about the why because we, don't, we rely on people to sow and give to this ministry so we can do what we do. But when I start tying your relationship to God to that, it gets problematic. And so we have to be recognizing when, hey, church institution, things are getting in the way and starting to become a veil to seeing who God truly is and people's relationship with God. I think we got that. We'll, we'll cover some more in the next week. Let's, let's keep going through the filter. Number two, superstitions. I come from the South, so there's a million and one superstitions down there. And everything you could do will give you seven years bad luck. I don't care what it is, man. Pick a penny up on tails instead of heads, seven years bad luck. Break a mirror, seven years bad luck. Walk under a ladder, seven years bad luck. I grew up with that. And then I got old enough to finally think for it myself. And I was like, okay, especially because I worked with my dad and some construction stuff and things. We had to use a ladder a lot. And I was like, we don't walk under a ladder because that's a safety thing. That's, that's OSHA violation, man. You can get hurt really bad that way. This has nothing to do with seven years bad luck. It's just it's not smart to walk under a ladder. But we tied it to this great big superstition thing that all of a sudden, if we walked under this ladder, everything in our life was going to go wrong. And, you know, oh, if I broke that mirror. Dude, I, I, I did a season where I worked um, with a cousin of my, on my mom's side of the family. We, we, we installed glass mirrors and shelving and shower doors and things like that. So I got really familiar around major glass mirrors. Also, I was glad almost when I left that job, I enjoyed who I worked with, but I was like, you were walking in on pins and needles every day because I saw what happens when a mirror breaks. It can slice you up. You do not want to break a glass mirror. You can get cut all the pieces through that and be in an emergency room getting stitched all up. So was it really bad luck or was it just don't break a mirror because it's really unsafe? Because there's wisdom in that. And of course, you see, I point those out because those are like, well, duh, kind of deals. But then we do it in church. Because now we think, oh, well, I didn't get on with Pastor West with the 930 confessions to do Psalms 91. And then um, I had a car wreck later. And you, and you start translating those things over to, well, I, didn't, I missed my confessions this morning. I guess that's why I had a car wreck. I must have had bad luck. You see how it starts correlating with all that. And superstitions come out a lot of stuff like that. When you realize, I think God can still be good and protect you even if you forget your confessions one morning. See, the confessions are not to get God to protect you. The confessions are to remind you that God is always protecting you so you don't walk around in fear all the time. All those things are there to change us, not move God. That's a, a, a big reality when you, you start switching these things around, especially when you start dealing with superstitions. Well, 
My grandpappy said that, and then my, my great-grandpappy said it, and my grandpappy said it, and then my dad said it. And so I'm telling it to my son now, 20 years later, this is just what we've always done. Nobody ever questioned it. And so we have to watch out for superstitions in the church. There is a, th- a thousand of them. We throw out what uh, we call fleeces. Some of my old-timers will get that. So you have to recognize when superstitions are getting in the way and becoming a veil. Next one is time period. I tell this to people all the time. When you're reading the word, time period matters. What context was it being said in? Why was someone saying that? When was it being said? You know, there's a lot of things in the Old Testament because of it was a world without science and technology, by the way. There, when I say without science, that's not a 100% accurate statement. There was a lot more science than probably we realize. But the, there was no internet back then. Shoot, the internet came around in my time. There was no cell phones back then. At least not overall, especially, but way back then. There were, it wasn't like, hey, I'm going to pick up the phone and I'm going to call John or James. No, I got to send a pigeon or something, or I got to send a mail carrier and hope and pray it gets there within a month. I ain't going to hop in the car and drive one day. You know, me, Nicole, and I can jump in the car now with, with, with the car and advancement and in less than 15 hours go from New York all the way to Georgia, where I'm originally from, and visit family. Back then, that would have been like a, a week journey. Maybe more. So it's important to recognize, hey, certain things are set up. And I say this because... Let's take the Bible, for example. The Bible is Hebrew and Greek. It's not even written in original English language. And there's always this rule in all languages. And, and our church has a privilege. We're very, you know, we have a lot of mix in our church when it comes from people all over the world. People that speak various different languages. And I always say this because, like, for example, I can learn Spanish. And I can learn how to speak. I haven't done it yet. I'll say that, but I can learn to speak it fluently, but there's still certain cultural references that I can't connect with even when I'm communicating. I may be able to say ball and then say ball in Spanish or hello, you know, and and say that in Spanish. But there's a lot of cultural reference. Like when I talk even in English, for example, I have a lot of Southern references because there is a certain culture with that. In the South, we have a lot of especially expressions um, that would come out of this. And people are like, what the heck do you mean like that? But in the South, people know exactly what I'm talking about. And I can be talking to someone else who speaks English. And so there is a breakdown of translation from culture, that plays a factor in the Bible, from time period, that plays a factor in the Bible, Uh, all these different things. So what I'm also saying is be able to filter those things. I love when it's like, you know, for the, the, my generation, the generation before and the generation before, they, somebody starts quoting me, and, I, and I'm kind of at the place, I'm like, guys, we got to just stop this. Hey, you know, Brother Hagen used to say, first of all, most people my age and below don't even know who Brother Hagen is at this point. So there is absolutely no connection there. Second of things, Brother Hagen did what Brother Hagen did in his time. And I even appreciate it. I've read a lot of his books. I've learned a lot from him. But man... There is nothing on the grace of God back then. There might be residue or little flickers of it, but there's nothing about it. They did what was their time, but they were walking in a different light and limited light and speaking from a different time period. So there's things that we have to recognize the settings. So that's one filter. Um, Run out of time, let me keep moving. Number four, these other two are big, big one. Big, 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 big one. Number four is human beings. Whenever the Word of God is being taught or God is being expressed, you have to recognize there's the filter of a flawed human being it has to go through. This one, we are in so denial about this. I did this, you know, as, as when I was my lead pastor years, I saw this a lot um, with Dr. Dollar. They didn't do it with Pastor Abby because, you know, she's a woman. What, what does women do? Um, and I'm being facetious when I say that. Uh, but that was the attitude, really bad. You know, most people didn't go around. Well, Pastor Abby said, no, they're like, man, whatever she said. Um, you know, it was just like insane. And um, that, that was another side of lead pastoring for a while. But while I was spending time with them, you know, a lot of people would go, well, Dr. Dollar said, 
And I'll be like, that's weird because I was just in the back with them Saturday night and we were talking about things and getting ready and prepping for some things. And I don't think that's what he said. And what a lot of times it's like, he may have said something, but it was so ripped out of context, so taken different ways, so taken as such a level of absolution. And as preachers, we have to be careful. So it's not just the congregation, it's the preachers. The man of God said, okay, you said two things there. You said a man of God, a human. Everything they say is not 100% straight Bible, and people take it that way. Now, as preachers, we have to be cautious. That's why I talk a lot the way I talk. Where I'm like, I, I, you know, I learned this from one of my spiritual brothers, and, and I, it, it has saved me a lot of grief in ministry. He would say, I'm, I feel like God is leading me this way. People are like, well, that, that doesn't sound like confidence. No, that's humility, actually. Because we're admitting the fact, we ain't God. We ain't human. I got no business going in there flat out telling you, I've heard from God to tell you how to live your life. Man, you got to figure that out between you and your relationship with God. That's not my business. I have no authority to do that. And you see pastors dictating and telling people how to live their lives as if they are the Holy Spirit. And no, you're a human being just like everybody else. So I want you to recognize human beings express that, even me. I don't have everything perfect. No one does. Dr. Dollar, he's in part of he's like, why would you say that? He flat out told me this multiple times. He's like, I don't, I, I've seen this man miss it. Just like human. And, and it didn't make me think any less of it. Actually, man, it was like, because I also saw the way he handled it and the way he responded to it and the way he owned it. And it, it was a lot of character in it that built things in me, by the way. And it also, I was so glad that he, one, trusted me enough to, to have that moment in front of me and be human so I could learn from it and I wouldn't be a false perfectionist myself. And it, that's part of the reason I can talk the way I talk like this today because I learned that from them. So I don't have to be perfect and I don't want to preach and tell you that perfection. So when you're hearing the word, understand it's coming through human beings and their opinions get in, in sometimes put in it. Their, their thoughts, you don't have to 1,000 subscribe to everything a certain preacher says. Please don't ever do that with anybody or me. So those things are filtered. All these things are, why are you saying this? They become the veil. They shrink God. They make God smaller is what they do. The last one is, I would say this, and uh, definitely ran out of time. Jesus. I'll be able to get through the filter part, though. Uh, which is good. And then we'll just pick it up next week. Um, the last number five is personal experience. Personal experience is wonderful if it's in its right place. Personal experience, I share personal experiences all the time. Um, they're examples. They're meant to inspire people. They're meant to give people hope. Uh, they're they're testimony-wise is more what they are. But my, I'm also careful how I present it and also how I... I don't really teach it as you should do this because this is what I experienced with God because my personal relationship that brings me liberty with God and the rules that God and I have set up for me as an individual can become your destructive bondage. And preachers have to be careful because I hear us all do that. And I have to watch mine. That's why I go back and list some of my messages because I'm like, eh, did you, did you kind of get over in some of these things? And there are people talk about, man, and it sounds good. It gets the oohs and the ahs. And then somebody goes out there and tries to remanufacture. You know, this preacher's like, well, I gave this money over here because I believe God told me to do it. And I saw this breakthrough happen and that. That's a personal experience. And I'm not here to knock down that person. Well, I experienced. Yes, you did because the Spirit of God was leading you into something. But that doesn't mean this person over here now needs to make it their rule to live by. And that's the balance. And we, it's not just preachers, it's all various Christians. You, you know, you hear grandmama talk about, well, I always did this. Well, that may have worked for you and you can learn some wisdom from that. Don't get me wrong. I'm not dismissive towards those things. Like I said, I just put them in their proper place so they don't become a blinder to when God needs to be bigger. Because all these areas, if you hear real quick, church institution, superstitions, time period, human beings that are flawed, 
and personal experience can become conditions to limit God in our lives. Especially when they get hijacked with self. Selfishness can creep into all these things that are good, that you can glean from some of these things. You can learn from some of these things. These are functionalities. These are part of it. But when selfishness comes in and hijacks them, it can really become a blinder to God. So I want you, when you're learning how to rightly, where do we start? We started with rightly dividing the word. Recognize whenever you're hearing a message, whenever you're, you're reading the word, whenever you're doing any experience with God, even in yourself, by the way, whenever it's just your one-on-one time with God, these things play a factor. Well, what do I do with all this? The final question I'll ask, I'll answer with that. Because you're like, well, now I, I don't want you to be afraid or think these things are evil or bad necessarily. I just want you to be aware and be able to recognize when, hey, maybe that's, that, that, that's coming in a little bit. And be able to sort through. Old country saying, they used to say, you know, um, horse, chew the, uh, chew the hay and, uh, and, and spit out the sticks. Or, you know, chew the steak and spit out the bone. Just because there's bone in the steak, you know, T-bone steak right there. Oh man, I can't eat this bone, so let me just throw the whole steak out. No. You eat around the bone, enjoy the good steak, and throw away the worthless bone. Be wise to do that in all these things you hear so it doesn't make God small. It doesn't make God petty. It doesn't make God this thing because human beings get in the way sometimes and God gets misrepresented. Uh, I'm going to pause right there and it's literally like a pause. So we're going to pick up next week. And I I landed at this point of recognizing self versus spirit. And we got, we talked about that last week uh, over in Galatians five from the message. I'm going to really pick up right there and walk you through some things after we, now we've talked about the filters we talked about the week before saying, okay, I'm willing to come out of my old, old, old ideas of God. I've learned how to recognize when I'm filtering and things are acting like a blinder to me now. We walk through some things right there. Now let me learn how to, to, now that we got to the root of some of these issues, am I tapping into the spiritual aspect of getting to know God or am I getting to know God through selfishness? Through selfishness and how to recognize some of those things. And then I'll have one other week after that uh, we'll get into the part four where what is what is at the root of that selfishness uh, is when I get and how to break free from it. So hope you guys are getting some out of this. I know it's like we're, we're breaking it down a lot. I know it's a lot of heavy teaching with this, but if you can get this mindset a little more, it'll help you. Uh, I want to equip people really how to one, read the word, hear messages, uh, how to be able to grow in their understanding because we're telling people and all you're getting, get understanding. But if you don't know really how to do that, um, and I didn't through a lot of my early 20s, so it led me to a lot of messed up views about God that really injured my life. And I'm hoping to pass a lot of those things on so you can set, you can jump out, skip some of those or undo some of those or whatever it is. That way you can experience a true God of love. All right, um, this next part. Uh, if you have never made Jesus Lord of your life, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. And this isn't about, you know, using fear to say you better do this or else. It is about, man, do you see how good God is? Are you tired of selfishness running the show, feeling miserable, feeling hurt, feeling broken? And I'm not promising, you know, you pray a prayer and magically, everything's, everything's magically fixed. But I also know the beauty of having Uh, what I call the higher power, which is God, something greater than my selfishness, which is love, which is God, which is Jesus. And when that comes in your life, it starts rearranging everything. It starts healing things. It starts setting things in the right direction. And it becomes, God becomes, because you're permitting God to, you're permitting God to become an active daily force in your life that, that will make your life better day to day, or at least help you get through the junk you may be facing. So if you need to pray that prayer, if you've never done that, repeat this after me. Jesus, I make you Lord of my life. Come into my heart and show me your love and show me how to love. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, the first thing I say is congratulations. We celebrate you. Those in the Facebook chat, YouTube chat, make them feel loved, welcomed, and appreciated. We celebrate your decision, though, and we know your life will never be the same. Here's the next thing I'd like you to do. Uh, as you see the lower thirds pop up, I'd like you to text the keyword, I'm saved. That's all one word. I'm saved to 51555. And we want to give you an opportunity to exchange some information so you can download a free ebook about how much God loves you. I encourage you to do that. And uh, I know your life will never be the same. The other thing we encourage you to do is keep connecting. Now, if this is a place you feel like you can connect, I would love for you to call this place your church home. Uh, we have virtual services on Thursday at 7 p.m. every Thursday. And like tonight, every Saturday at 6 p.m. We also, if you live in the local area, I'd love an opportunity to see you, meet you, and greet you and get to know your name at our Sunday services at 10.30 a.m., which is tomorrow morning, by the way. We have it every Sunday, 10.30 a.m. at the Alhambra Ballroom and right in uh, New York City. So if you're able to make it out, I hope to see you there. But we celebrate your decision. And once again, your life will never, ever be the same. The next thing we'd like to do is we want to open this up to everybody for an opportunity to give. As I even mentioned in this message already, it was stated why we give, which is not out of fear, but it's not something you have to do. It is literally, we have been blessed, and now we are choosing to be a blessing in this moment. And I, and I just remind you, do what only God puts on your heart and what is within your means, okay? If it's not something you don't have, man, then we're just believing God that your needs are met and that you eventually get in a position where you're able to help other people. Um, but don't let also that become shame or guilt or force you or feel pushed into doing something that you aren't comfortable with. Uh, we want you to be doing something that you are enjoying, that you are at peace with, and you're making a quality decision to say, I'm in the position to help others. Now let me do that. Uh, and the lower thirds is popping up how to do that. you got our QR code. You can scan with your camera phone right there, and a little link will pop up. You can click that link. Uh, we got our text to give. You see how to do that. You can mail it in. You see our bill box listed there. And then, of course, the final way, if you have our mobile app downloaded, you can click the Give tile and give safely and securely that way. But whatever you choose to do, know those funds are going in to get this message of grace and hope out to people, to help the members in our church as we are able to and financially able to. And then, of course, to pour back into our local New York City community monetarily via partner agencies or whether we do our own outreach and help people out. Um, we are actively, we, we commit to making sure your funds are going towards as much as possible from once the bills are paid straight towards the cause is what we want to, to really change people's lives. So let's pray and then um, we'll do some announcements and then I'll bring us back here and we'll dismiss. But let's pray over this. Heavenly Father, we submit these gifts of love, gratitude, and uh, blessings to you right now and pray that they go forward and change people's lives. We thank you as we sow. Uh, we know that, one, you're taking care of us and we have nothing to be afraid of and that we are able and empowered to be a blessing to people. We thank you these funds are received with integrity and they go forward with the intent that they were given in, which is to help people's lives. We thank you they have wisdom surrounded to create maximum impact in people's lives as we get this message of hope out to people and we monetarily sow back into people's lives and help ease their suffering. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, a couple quick announcements, and then we'll be right back here. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you caught those announcements. Uh, and of course, we got our um, we got our service tomorrow. I hope to see you there. Man, we're going to have an awesome time. We're going to celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. It's going to be a good time, so I hope to connect with you. But let's pray and we'll dismiss. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for this time. In the Word, we thank you for the Spirit has poured in us. We thank you it continues to grow and flourish in us and remove the blinders so we can see you as love more than ever, Father. Thank you that everyone in the sound of my voice experience your goodness, your blessings, your favor, 
your peace and your protection in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. All right, everybody, have a great night. I'm a world